Welcome to another General Psychology video mini lecture. This is Ian McFarlane and today we are going to be talking about how to measure psychological constructs and we're going to focus specifically on intelligence. Okay, so we're going to talk today about how to measure psychological constructs. Now in psychology we're somewhat limited because a lot of the things we're interested in don't have physical properties. So for example in the physical sciences if you want to get the mass of an object or calculate its volume there are specific physical tasks you can do to measure the, um, the property with incredible accuracy. When we want to measure someone's, say, intelligence, however, we can't take that person's intelligence out and put it on a scale or measure the amount of water it displaces. Um, we just aren't able to access those kinds of measurements that the physical science uses. This is because many of the things we're studying in psychology are called latent variables. Okay? They're not measurable directly. So we have to measure them in indirect ways. Since we lack direct uh, measures of these constructs, we have to be really careful about the way we go about doing it, and we have to be able to show uh, empirically with data that what we're doing makes sense. Okay, so we're going to talk specifically about intelligence, uh, but much of what we talk about will apply to many variables we'll talk about throughout the semester. So how do we go about actually measuring intelligence? And the primary approach that we use, especially in modern psychology, is the psychometric approach. Psychometric meaning that we use uh, psychological tests to produce measures of intelligence. So let me start with the most common way of measuring uh, intelligence in psychology. Uh, when we were originally set out to measure intelligence, we were trying to capture essentially the mental age of an individual. So the mental age is the, the age at which you function mentally. Okay? The, the age of intel intellectual development you've reached. You may hear sometimes that uh, so-and-so has a, a first grade level of intelligence or a, the intelligence of a five-year-old. Okay, essentially that's the idea of mental age. Okay, now chronological age is what the calendar says you are. So if you've been alive for 10 years, your chronological age is 10. But for example, you may be functioning at a very high level for a 10-year-old. So your mental age might actually be quite higher, okay, maybe 15. Okay, now the, the traditional IQ, okay, and IQ just means intelligence quotient. Okay, when this was originally developed, it was actually just a quotient. Okay, it was the ratio of your mental age to the chronological age, and you multiplied that by 100. Okay, so mathematically, that just looks like this. You take the mental age, so in our previous example, 15, divided by the calendar age, or chronological age, of 10, gives you 1.5. Multiplied by 100 would give you an IQ of 150. Okay, an IQ that was lower than your chronological age, Okay, would be if you uh, had a mental age of 7, but you were 10 years old, okay, your IQ would be 70. Okay? If your mental age and your chronological age were the same thing, okay, so you had mental age divided by calendar age uh, equaled 1, kind of where you ought to be, where most people should tend to be, is right at 100. And that was actually set as the population average. Now, we don't uh, calculate IQ this way anymore. Okay, we, we do this um, differently in that we've given IQ tests to hundreds of thousands of people over the years. And so we have, for every chronological age, a big set of norms. That is, a group of scores we can compare yours to. So when I give an IQ test to a 18-year-old, um, I can compare that person's scores to the thousands of other 18-year-olds uh, that are in the norm group, and it will tell me how that person is performing compared to their peers, okay, their same age peers. Now, anytime we're measuring a latent construct, we need to be thinking about two principles of measurement, okay, reliability and validity. 
So reliability is how consistent the measurement is. Okay, so if I measure something more than once and it hasn't changed, then I ought to get the same result every time. For example, when you step on your bathroom scale, it shows you your weight. Now, if you get off the scale and get back on, it should tell you the same weight if it's a reliable measurement. If every time you got on the scale there was a different number, this, the scale would have very poor reliability. Now we want the same thing when we ha are measuring latent constructs. Okay, we want to be able to reproduce uh, the same results when we measure the same person. Hey, now it's a little bit trickier uh, when you come to latent variables in most of these psychological constructs, um, but we're shooting for strong reliability. Okay, the other component we need is validity. Now validity is the accuracy of the measurement. Okay, so again, I'm going to re uh, return to the bathroom scale example. Okay, if I stepped on the scale and it gave me the same number every time, I'd be satisfied that it was reliable. But if the number it gave me every time was 10 pounds heavier than I really am, the validity would be poor. Okay, so even though it's uh, reliable, it may not be valid. Another way to think about this is, is if you played darts. Okay, the object of darts is you're trying to throw your dart to hit the bullseye. Okay, well, if you really play darts, you know, there's actually the, the triple 20 might be worth more points. And depending on what game you're playing, you may have to uh, target different sectors. But for the sake of the example, let's just assume you're trying to hit the bullseye every time. So if you threw five darts and the board looked something like this, okay, you're neither a reliable nor a valid uh, dart thrower. Okay, it's not reliable because you hit multiple points all over the board and it's not valid because you're not hitting the actual target. Now you could be a reliable dart thrower but not a valid one. So an example like the like the case of the bathroom scale is 10 pounds off. Okay, in the dart board it would look something like this. Okay, it's reliable. You're hitting pretty much the same spot every time, but you're not hitting the bullseye. Okay, we want our measurements as much as possible to be both reliable and valid. Okay, to be striking very close to the bullseye every single time. Okay, the degree to which we um, are able to accomplish this is the quality of the measure that we're using. Okay, so if I gave you an IQ test and it said your IQ was 105, okay, then next week I gave you the same IQ test, presumably if my test was reliable, you ought to get very close to 105. Now you may not get exactly 105 the second time. Uh, for example, there might be other things that play into it. Maybe you got a bad night's sleep the second night, or you're feeling under the weather, or you skipped breakfast. Okay, there's a whole host of things that could shift which might affect your score in small ways. But overall, we want to select measurements that are as reliable as possible, because reliability is a necessary condition for validity. You can have reliability but not have validity, like the middle uh, dartboard pictured here, but you can't have validity without reliability. You can't be hitting the, the bullseye every time if you're not hitting uh, the bullseye consistently. Okay? Now reliability is fairly easy for us to assess. Okay? We can just give tests over again, we can have different people take the same test. Figuring out the validity of a measurement tool, however, takes a little more doing. Okay, so it's a little more complicated because we don't know the true latent value. If we did, we wouldn't have to measure it. Okay, so how we assess validity needs a little more explanation. Okay, so there's a number of different ways to, to test validity to explore how valid something is. Um, we're gonna talk about a couple of them if you go on to take research methods in psychology, uh, you'll learn much more thorough ways to assess validity. But one way to think about validity is predictive validity. Okay, This is how well your test measures some kind of future result. Uh, for example, the SATs are meant to predict how well you will do academically your first semester of college. 
Okay, so we can test the predictive validity of the SAT by comparing people's SAT scores to the GPA they earn in their first semester. Okay, construct validity is another way to assess validity. Okay, and this looks at the ways that your measurement is correlated with other types of measurements. Okay, so in other words, if I'm testing uh, intelligence, it should have a strong correlation with other measures of intelligence, okay, because they're measuring similar constructs. If I'm trying to measure intelligence and I find out it correlates very highly with how tall you are, that's not a good thing. Okay, people's height should have nothing to do with their intelligence. Okay, so construct validity is where you test your, um, your instrument against various other variables and you want to see if the correlations between your instrument and some other instruments match how you think they should play out. Okay, the, the way we measure validity in terms of how we assess it numerically is through a validity coefficient. Okay, this is simply the correlation between the measurement scores and some external criteria. So if I return to the SAT example, this would be the correlation of SAT score and the uh, first semester college GPA. So that's a quick overview of reliability and validity and a brief discussion of the kind of origins of where IQ comes from. Okay, in class this week, we'll talk more about measurement issues specific to intelligence, but reliability and validity will be a theme we return to throughout the course. Okay? If you have any questions about the content of this video, uh, make sure to read about it in your textbook, but you can also send me an email or come by office hours, and I'm happy to explain anything that's tripping you up. Well, until next time, I look forward to seeing you in class.